Do please be seated. What are the voices that you most pay attention to? And what are the ones that you are most likely to ignore? Now, if you're married, it can go either way, can't it? Uh, we know that of all the people on earth, uh, we should listen most closely, most lovingly, most sensitively to our spouse. But I wonder if it's only me that's ever had the experience where your better half asks you sharply, are you listening to me? There's a pause as you rapidly replay the best you can remember of the last few seconds of the half-ignored conversation to see if you can remember enough to get away with it. I rarely do. The reality is that there are many voices competing for our attention. Sometimes you're in a group and you can half hear the conversation that's going on next to you and it's just more interesting than the one you're involved in. Perhaps you've got the radio on or we're in a busy street where we hear many voices at once. I was in uh, Chester yesterday for James's ordination and uh, popped round the crowded markets afterwards. There were people advertising their wares from the stalls. There were loud conversations in groups of friends who'd perhaps sampled a little too much of the gin stalls uh, as they were going round. Uh, there was a preacher with a microphone trying to make himself heard, as far as I could see, throughout the entire centre of Chester. And it's not just literal voices. We have our own inward conversations, or again, I hope I'm not the only one who has those. Uh, the quiet voice of conscience, the internal arguments, uh, when we just can't make up our minds about something, the anxious or bleak thoughts that seem to speak to us from the darkness. And we have the voices of authority, maybe not literal ones, that steer our sense of right and wrong, of good and bad, of true and false. Do we follow the science or do we follow our hearts? There are so many voices. Which ones should we pay attention to? Which ones should we trust? Well, this evening I want to look with you at just the first three verses of the last Bible reading, which Charles, our church warden, read for us a few moments ago, Hebrews chapter 1, just looking at verses 1 to 3. The author of this anonymous New Testament letter makes explicit what is assumed or taught everywhere in the Bible, this one great truth, that God speaks. Your creator and mine is not a silent, impersonal force. He has a voice, for he is a person. And the reason he speaks, as for all of us, is his desire to be heard. As I was writing this, the phone rang. Someone wanted to speak to me, wanted to communicate with me. So they used words. It's dodgy when someone rings you up and all you can hear is a breathing on the other end of the line. That's just not right. If you want to be heard to connect and communicate with another human being, you have to use words. And our author tells us uh, that the God who made all the universe, including you and me, speaks in order to communicate with us, to make himself known, uh, to invite us to respond to him in faith and delight and love and obedience. In our text, there are two ways in which God speaks. Uh, in the past, before Christ came, and now, since uh, the first Christmas in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Look at the text. In the past, uh, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son. The first part of the Bible, the Old Testament is a record, he says, and not just of people and what they did, but of God and what he said. And there really were some wonderfully varied ways in which God spoke. He spoke to Moses through a burning bush, to Balaam through a talking donkey, to Belshazzar through the writing on the wall. And yes, that is where we get the phrase in English from. Yet it isn't the variety that's most important, but the one big message that God was speaking over all those centuries through their endless variety. We've heard some of the key turning points already in our service this evening. 
We started in Eden in Genesis chapter 3. God had made a good world, but Adam and Eve sinned and God has cursed. And yet even here, so early in the Bible, there was a promise of hope to come. A son of Eve would come and crush the serpent's head and undo the curse. In Genesis 22, which we heard in Cantonese, Isaac is spared as the Lord provides a ram. God will show his mercy. He will undo his curse by giving a substitute to bear the curse in our place. Isaiah 9 takes up the story. In the place of gloom and distress will come a child who is not a prophet, but who is fully and eternally God, one whose authority and peace will be endless, and in whom is light and joy. God spoke in the past through the prophets to prepare the way for his son, Jesus Christ. And in him, God has spoken his final word. So the New Testament bears witness to the God who keeps his promises. And therefore the challenge to us is will we listen to him? Mary listens and accepts the Lord's calling to bear the Son of God. Now, Caesar doesn't listen, but he unwittingly fall, uh, falls into the divine plan to ensure the Messiah is born in Bethlehem, keeping yet another of God's ancient promises. The angels make the joyful announcement, the Savior is born, the divine child who will take our place under God's judgment, bearing the curse so that we might inherit his blessing. And there are the shepherds, not the great ones, but they're listening to the word of God as it comes. Uh, later in the gospel story, uh, the father himself speaks and his words could stand as a summary of the whole Bible. This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. For we listen to the Lord when he speaks to us. In the midst of so many voices, are we listening to the one voice that really matters? Just look who Jesus is. Uh, we see him at this time of year as the helpless baby, and so he once was. But the baby grew up, died on a cross, rose again, and has now been appointed, our author tells us, the heir of all things. If you're heir to an enormous estate, uh, you don't have to worry too much. One day a vast fortune uh, will come your way. The Son of God has been appointed by his Father to be heir of all things. Just pause and weigh up that phrase for a moment. It's an extraordinary claim. All authority is his. Everything that exists in the created universe belongs to him, including you and everything you think you possess. It is quite a claim. But unlike a human landlord, uh, who will probably take this as an excuse to put the rent up, uh, this divine heir puts all of his possessions, all of his power to work together for the good of those who love him. Should we not listen to him who loves us so? For not only uh, is he the heir, he is also the creator. He is the one through whom God made the universe. The Son of God existed eternally before he was a baby that first Christmas. Everything that exists was made through him. And so if we want to know where we came from, who made this world, why we are here and what on earth it all means, then listen to the voice of the one who designed the arrangement of the stars, who established the universal constants of the physical universe, and who imprinted the image of God on all of humankind. Who is this Jesus? He is both God and man. And if the nativity accounts emphasize his humanity, our author puts, <clears throat> puts his stress on his divinity. He goes on to say the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. In the end, you cannot separate the sun from the father any more than you can separate the rays that come from the sun in the sky from the sun itself. As Jesus was to put it when he went around teaching, anyone who has seen me has seen the father. So if you want to know the God who is there, look to Jesus and listen to him. He's not locked up in history 
or myth, even today, at this very moment, he is sustaining all things by his powerful word. Uh, powerful word. Uh, here is the deepest explanation for the next breath that you will take. Jesus Christ is even now sustaining your life and causing every atom to function in the way that it should throughout the created order. At the cross for which he was born, he is the one who made all things, who is the heir of all things, who yet comes and willingly lays down his life to pay our debts, to bear our curse, finally reversing that which was spoken all the way back on the day of our first disobedience, to die our death and in rising to give us hope. His work is complete and finished, for after he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven, his work done, his word complete. All we need to do is read and hear and respond ourselves to him. God speaks to us in the scriptures and in his son because quite simply, he wants us to know him. And we have that choice as whether we will hear and respond. And if you say to me, well, other religions make their claims about good God too? Well, yes, they do, but they can't all be true. If Islam is true and Jesus is merely another prophet, then Christianity is a lie. If Christianity is true and Jesus is God in human flesh, then Islam is a lie. And if atheism is true and Jesus is incidental to human history, then why don't the nagging doubts go away? A sense that life should have more meaning than random chance and blind evolution would ever allow. Now, in all our listening, we have to do the weighing up of what we hear. We have to ponder those voices for ourselves. We have to make our own decision. But in the end, let me urge you, in a world of many voices, not to miss the one voice that really matters. Jesus Christ, your creator, sustainer, saviour and Lord has spoken and he's calling you to come and trust and follow him. We'd love to welcome you back here at St John's in the coming weeks and months as we seek to listen to him and follow him. Why don't you pick up one of the four gospels in the New Testament and let God speak to you directly. But don't close your ears to his voice for he yet lives and he yet speaks, and it is your ears that he wishes to address. I'm going to lead us in a short prayer, and then we shall come to sing our final carol. Lord Jesus, you have come from your Father, bringing God to earth. You came to be born as an infant, but you grew up to be our Saviour. And in taking our sins and bearing our curse, you have opened the way for us to know you and your Father and the fullness of your Holy Spirit today and always. That's for some, these things are strange or new. Please would you open our ears that we might hear your invitation and come and respond in faith and obedience. For we ask it to your Father's glory. Amen.